our first talk, I said that as time and condition permitted, we would also go a little further into uh, anecdotes about General Albert Pike. And perhaps one that would be of interest is rather an evidence of his literary skill, his power of expression, and something of the inner poetry of the man which made it possible for him to be so faithful an interpreter of works themselves deeply and reverently poetic. Uh, the particular fragment that I want to read is taken from a letter and uh, by nature and circumstances of the letter is important. Uh, early in uh, 1891 one of General Pike's very close friends passed on, one whom he regarded with peculiar and profound affection. And in conformity with the practices of the Masonic Order, when an active member of the 33rd degree passes on, it was customary to send certain announcements and instructions to the various Masonic bodies. This is the subject of a particular letter which is written in the Orient of Washington District of Columbia the 10th day of March 1891 unto the bodies and brethren of our obedience Shalom which means as I said last week peace Shalom peace that comes with blessing to care fretted weary men when death's dreamless sleep ends all suffering and sorrow because it may be that after a little while long illness will cause total disability, I must endeavor to perform with feeble hand and confused mind this pious duty to the memory of one who was my dearest friend and whose death is my infinite loss and deprivation irreparable. A little later he adds, the poet Holmes compares an old man to one who in company with a few friends clings to a spa floating in mid-ocean. From it one after another, weakened in and weary of the struggle of life, drops off into the sea, wherein is no trace of what has been, nor foreshadow of what may come, until at last only one survives, and with the illimitable sea around and under him and the illimitable sky above him. He is the loneliest creature that lives in all the world. It is a cruel blow of ill fortune when one, who in his old age counts the years of his life by their losses, is suddenly thus bereft of another of his few remaining companions and friends. For to live in the joy that is past, of companionship and good offices, is to live in the remembrance of a dream that faints and fades away and there is no hope of any new joy of like companionship to come. The letter is signed by General Pike and three weeks after he wrote it he died. It is his last official document to the Masonic Order. But I think the spirit of it shows something of the extraordinary gentleness and deepness of the man and of his wonderful power to express, even when himself in his last illness, uh, his thoughts and his solicitudes uh, to the family and associates of his departed brother. One of the last pictures of General Pike is this one taken probably about 1884. He is shown wearing the decoration that was bestowed upon him uh, by King Kalakua of Hawaii. Here is the last picture, I think, also that was taken of General Pike. He is certainly one of those men who may be regarded as a birth out of time. He belonged to a very gentle classical way of life that has almost entirely disappeared from among us. So we have another little episode in his life and as time goes on we will try to bring in others. But. Uh, 
I think for the reason of the weight of our subject tonight that um, we should proceed uh, with our major trend. Uh, many friends and uh, uh, those interested are aware that uh, Freemasonry contains certain symbolic teachings and ideas and that in particular the Scottish degrees so named for some peculiar reason because they originated in France the, uh, this particular uh, uh, group of degrees uh, is involved in a long and panoramic analysis and study of the great symbolisms and teachings of the world in an effort so to say to restore in the mind of the beholder something of the long and wonderful tradition of human effort and human achievement. We have already said that General Pike was one of the earliest American students of the Zen language and also a great student of Sanskrit. Uh, early in his researches he came to certain conclusions about the origin of Indian culture and he was deeply and strongly influenced by the Zarathustrian religion. Because of this deep interest, uh, fragments uh, from his researches are to be found in the liturgies and legendas of the rites. And in every instance, they are treated with the greatest dignity and solemnity. He was one of the early scholars who in the study of Indic tradition was deeply impressed by the importance of the early Iranian contribution uh, to the great flowering of Indian culture. And I think the fact that he made his own translations of the Zendavesta and many other of the Persian sacred and classical writings and also an original translation of most of the Mahabharata and the Institutes of Manu, that we see he was a serious person and that his vision in this matter should be as advanced and contemporary as it is, is rather surprising when we realize that in his day there was very little work in this field in the United States. Yet the book with which we are concerned and from which we will make a few quotations to so show the spirit of his researches was first published in 1871 so that we realize that he was quite a pioneer in this particular field. We may not be inclined to associate Masonic scholarship with these matters, uh, but as we go further we will realize that Masonry did produce a number of very good scholars such as Gould, Mackey, Oliver, and Pike. All of these men were students of comparative religion. Each one of them, from his own particular facet, his own approach to the uh, broad field was convinced of its essential importance. Each of these men also was basically an idealist. He believed in values, he believed in religion, he believed in the spiritual life of man. And this uh, dedication also reveals itself through the things that he wrote and said. Now it is impossible uh, in a manner which is entirely satisfactory in as brief a survey as we can uh, make of the general pattern to involve ourselves in all of the bypaths into which the general uh, traveled and explored along his way of thought. I've noticed that in uh, four or five pages for example he will make fairly elaborate references to seven or eight different religious systems with certain uh, specific details. Uh, this becomes a little too complicated for our present purpose so that it will be necessary to try to find out a certain of his basic opinions and teachings and feelings on this important subject. In the first place then, uh, Pike was among those who believed definitely in an early migration of peoples uh, from northwestern Asia into what is now called the Indo-Gangetic Plain. 
He believed that these people brought with them uh, a tremendous wealth of literature, in the sense not so much of books as of traditions and root material from which a great literature could gradually develop and unfold. In other words, they brought the ideas, they brought the, uh, the teachings of something, and that is one of the things that General Pike was very interested in discovering, if possible, uh, what they did bring and uh, why and how they came to bring it. He therefore enters into a discussion of what are called uh, the early ayahs, or peoples of the region. And Pike comes to the conclusion that the term ayah, meaning apparently the selected, or the anointed, or the set apart, or the placed in some unique and uh, holy condition uh, for things to come, that this term was not strictly applicable to a race and that we have therefore made a certain mistake, he feels, I'm speaking from his point of view, that we have made a mistake in assuming that the fact that these people were called the ayahs uh, makes it follow inevitably that they were exclusively what we call Aryan Hindus. He did not believe that such was the case. He held rather that this term covered a group uh, of values and factors moving into Northern Asia over a considerable period of time, consisting of tribes probably from the trans Himalat and the northern parts of that region, plus Turanian peoples and Iranian peoples, and that all these together more or less have come in popular mythology to be confused into a race, when really they were a group or a cycle of migrations moving in and all having a certain sacredness about them, which was responsible for the term uh, of the ayahs, and that this sacredness was in all probabilities bestowed upon them at a somewhat later date, so that the original designation is not contemporary with the migrations of the peoples. This brings another interesting point, which he feels has a bearing upon our situation. If these migrations took place over a considerable period of time, a, a strange and remarkable alchemy or chemistry results merely from the circumstance of timing. Time becomes terribly important as a means of modifying certain conditions and circumstances. A people, for example, moving from one area into another in ancient times, uh, carried uh, practically their entire culture with them. Once they had made a long migration, it was unlikely they would ever return to the original place. It was unlikely that they would even make any effort to communicate with it, because they carried with them their own total life. Thus they would center into a new locality, perhaps climatically uh, different, uh, inhabited probably, as in the case of India, by earlier peoples. Uh, still functioning, uh, particularly the Dravidian culture. And these people settling and remaining for a length of time and becoming accustomed to and acclimated to the, a certain region, uh, gradually modified their own culture through contact with other peoples and uh, with the gradual disappearance of their own immediate contact with earlier heritage. Thus they became a comparatively new people in a new area, but they also contained within their tribal tradition and national existence the roots of their beginnings and the great mythologies, legends, and convictions which moved them. Uh, if a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years later, another migration perhaps, arising from almost the same source as the first, should then move downward and come into this area. These two people with one origin and one root and one source would meet as strangers because of the difference of cultural interval, because of new interests, new activities arising. And these would no longer recognize their kinship with each other. Uh, the new peoples would have made certain modifications in their beliefs, in their doctrines, in their ideas and might very well have been somewhat influenced by the tribes and groups into whose environment they came. Gradually, therefore, from similar sources or from almost identical beginnings, 
through waves of migration, strong cultural differences could come into existence, uh, gain uh, certain authority and validity, and result in distantly related peoples meeting as total strangers, even though perhaps in their origin such was not the case. Pike is then concerned a little bit with what these people brought and uh, why it was to play so important a part in the cultural life of our race. Why was not the heritage from somewhere else uh, more important? How did it happen that so many great streams of doctrine have come into existence and died? And why is it that one with a very strange and remote background should have become so extremely powerful and had such a lasting and enduring existence. Uh, General Pike in Morals and Dogma also points out that we have little if any appreciation of the actual magnitude of the influence that began in the trans -Himabat. that it represents far more than we will perhaps ever be able to recognize, that it not only influenced Asia and the Near East, but has influenced practically every culture on the face of the earth, that it continued to migrate and move, changing words and names, but not necessarily losing uh, philological identities, because underneath various words and terms in Germanic, in Slavic, even in the Latin and Greek languages, in the Hebrew, and in the dialects of the North, Central, and South American Indians, we find definite kinships. Uh, with the root words and root ideas of Northern Asia. Therefore, we can say with reasonable certainty in his thinking that there is practically no religion, no philosophy, and no science known to man which has not in some way uh, been strengthened, encouraged, motivated, propelled forward, enriched by this original uh, power that came from North Asia. Recognizing, therefore, that Asia seems to have conferred an impulse upon the whole world, Pike comes to the inevitable conclusion that there was something, something profoundly important, something undeniably forceful, something which man himself simply refused to permit to die. Man refused to depart from it. And by another strange and amazing circumstance, man was never able to outgrow it. He was never able to find that he could cast it aside as something no longer vital, necessary, or useful to him. Although Pike did not live in the days of Freud, Adler, and Jung, he did experiment with the psychological factor in thinking. He became convinced, therefore, that the great stream uh, which in some places he, with some apology, simply calls together the Veda, that this great stream undoubtedly flows not only through the world, as he says, like the seven sacred rivers of the Punjab. He also says that it flows through the living fabric of human consciousness, that in some way this ancient lore this old doctrine arose from some extraordinary degree of integrity within man, that man therefore comes back to it when he is at his best and departs from it only when he is at his worst, that in some mysterious way when uh, securities, prosperities, and indifferences dominate him, he forgets the law, but in his emergency he returns to it and is comforted by thought which the East has put into words but which Western man has sort of felt in his soul that whenever virtue should fail upon the earth the law again would come forth. That this something therefore is essentially part of the total psychology of man and that no other um, stream of lore no other great symbolic structure of belief has touched man so deeply, held his consciousness so firmly, or required such periodic restatement in order that man himself might keep faith with himself. 
and from the time in which Pike lived and from the general attitudes of the day, I think, in his, I think his position in this was that of a very liberal and sincere man with the deep appreciation of values. Concerning the entire problem further, Pike goes back still uh, beyond this, and he divides the concept of man concerning the origin of sacred things into two essential schools of belief. One is the belief that man uh, is strengthened or ordained in the beginning of his existence by revelation. In other words, that at the root of the great spiritual tradition of the race, which he identifies always with this great eastern complex of motions, uh, that this uh, motion began as mythology or legendary or law would seem to sustain by the pronouncements of sacred persons whose individualities and personalities are really beyond uh, our understanding and whose existence is so shadowy that we can scarcely delineate it. Therefore there is the belief that certain beliefs, certain doctrines, certain systems have endurance, have inevitability and infallibility because they are revealed by God uh, to prophets, to teachers, to messiahs, to patriarchs, and that this great motion of peoples carried with it from its root land a divine revelation, a revelation apart, a revelation to which the people and their descendants continually rededicated themselves. A revelation which in good times was strong and in poor times was weak. A revelation frequently confused and corrupted, but ever rising phoenix life from the ashes of its own dead. This uh, concept that these things came from an independent source, from a source beyond and above man, came by way of mediators, uh, came by way of persons who through one circumstance or another were brought like Moses or Zoroaster into the presence of the Most High and received the direct word of truth uh, from those roots and sources which human beings normally cannot approach and nor can they fully comprehend. Then Pike points out that there is a second the line of tradition that also must be given a certain amount of weight, namely that man's spiritual insight arises not from revelation, but from insight within himself, which is the root of a kind of revelation. In other words, that the human being is actually releasing through his own nature that God quality within himself, that power of internal veritable cognition by which man causes his doctrines, his philosophies, his religions, his arts and his sciences to come forth out of himself. That in coming forth out of himself and therefore not following the theological structure of revelation should not be regarded as conflict. It would only be regarded as an effort to understand the working of the one supreme power at the root of existence. Whether this working is from the sky or from strange supernatural beings, or whether this working is outward through creation itself, Pike, I think, is inclined somewhat to uh, value the second uh, point of view. He believes that the gods working in the roots of time work not upon but through men, and that from the earliest time man's search for light was always the effort to release his own godhood, a spontaneous divine power within himself that would not and could not be repressed, and that therefore true revelation was also insight, and insight was revelation and these two cannot be completely separated. 
for the internal life of man shares the eternity of all other things. And whether we regard this revelation as coming from the furthermost or from the innermost, either way we regard it, it is the same thing. Therefore, there is no need to say that insight or growth by experience is less sacred as a source of tradition or a source of valid knowledge than revelation itself. One, things are revealed to man. By the other, man reveals things through himself and they become known to himself. This uh, situation then led Pike to the beginning of his study of the great uh, symbolic processes which he sensed at the root of these great teachings. Being by instinct and nature, as his rituals and his writings and his interpretations imply, a symbolist, a person who believed tremendously in the integrating and releasing power of symbolic form, uh, Pike presented himself with this equation. He presented himself with man standing as an aboriginal being upon the surface of the earth, surrounded by stars, mountains, valleys, beholding everywhere the infinite workings of universal law. Man stood like a newborn child with eyes first opening perceiving all things with the first natural emotion of his kind, wonder. Nothing seemed natural. Nothing seemed commonplace. Nothing was ordinary. And yet, by the very wonder of it all and by his own childishness, nothing was extraordinary. The ordinary and the extraordinary were one. The wonderful and the real were not divided. Man contemplated the mysteries of existence without the kind of awe that we know, but with the wandering insight of childhood. He did not have the false indication or inclination to bow down and venerate. Like the small child, he had only the inclination to accept, the inclination to reach out his hands to the sun, reach out his hands to the moon. It, the distances meant nothing to his primordial thinking. The stars were only what they seemed to be. But whatever they were, they were wonderful. And most of all, this wonder gradually uh, focused itself upon those things nearest to man. The wonders of the sky, of the heavens, of the seasons, the strange mysteries of existence, the storms, the lightning, and the thunders, all the mysterious flames that rose in the sky from the great blazing altar of Agni, all these things became one group of wonders. But these wonders were so uh, superior, so aloof, so strange and universal in themselves that man did not immediately you know, feel the need to examine them. Perhaps he lacked the audacity of modern man who will examine anything, whether he discovers anything reasonable or not, he will continue to examine. But man then, by nature of his own existence and by his own circumstances, began to experience other wonders. And some of these wonders that he experienced were not so wonderful. Uh, they were, many of them, terrifying. Uh, the sky normally did not terrify him unless a great star moved across it, but the animal terrified him. The strange gleaming eyes of night representing some beast waiting, this terrified him. The individual was also perturbed and concerned by certain things that he beheld happening to himself. He experienced the mystery of birth. He saw childhood and youth. He saw maturity and age. He saw decrepitude and death. These things came directly to himself. He experienced pain. He began to feel the pang of loss. 
he began within his own strange simple nature uh, to gather up heaps of stones or pebbles or shells or bright rocks and say these are mine then somebody else would take them away from him and slowly the wonders of the heavens uh, remained a strange palace of gods beyond but the wonders of the earth became a source of concern a certain fretfulness uh, a certain disillusionment man began to uh, sense that in this great world of wonders he was curiously and strangely weak that he seemed separate from great things and bound to small ones that he had to fight the problems of hunger and shelter and he had to grope his way to the mystery of fire he had to learn to defend himself he had to learn so many lessons that little by little a division took place in his psychology and his thinking he divided life into two things uh, what we might term theoretical and practical uh, there was no division actually but theoretical things were grandeurs that did not directly touch him practical things were infirmities that he had to face every day and in spite of everything we see it in children growing around us this division takes place and by this very division general pike points out the gods inevitably began to retire to the sky because they were not quite available when man needed them here uh, the gods the greatnesses the great powers became less and less immediately accessible to man he did try uh, to recognize their values and their powers but still in spite of all his offerings in spite of all his prayers in spite of all his acceptances and his rejections life came and life went over these strange inevitables therefore it seemed that even the gods had not control and the believer and the unbeliever came finally to the common grave out of these situations these modifications another important factor seemed to arise in the early consciousness of these ancestral peoples and that particularly had to do uh, with the linking of heaven and earth and in the early linking of heaven and earth man not yet thoroughly aware of value inclined like the primitive American Aborigine of the poem to see God in fire and hear him in the wines uh, this man this primitive man began to uh, pray began to ask began to beseech uh, sought ways of turning in some mysterious manner to the all-father who his instinct told him he needed and he turned to this great world around him in search for parent in search for that to which he could confide that which would understand that which had the strength and power to make all things right out of its own inevitable sufficiency and out of the contemplation of stars and planets and rivers and seas and out of man's common need and out of his turning his eyes from his need toward the source of his help slowly as General Pike tells us the strange dim but inevitable image of deity arose arose because man inwardly experienced it rose because he could cast the shadow of his own dreams upon the clouds rose because he demanded it invoked it by the strangest and most subtle magic of all the magic of necessity and so by degrees the individual began to change the world changing the world into mine and not mine into heaven earth and hell into uh, wisdom and ignorance into hate and love and to all these polarizations with which we have gradually come to be familiar because this process 
was strangely natural because there was about it this integrity that we do not appreciate perhaps in our confused time it might be well to draw an analogy or take an example that would tell us something of what we mean suppose we say that a child born into this world was born into an absolutely natural environment an environment in which there were no false values an environment in which everything was honest honest in its own strange mysterious inevitable honesty the honesty of a truth or a fact uncorrupted and that this child growing up in this world of facts in which there were no myths no legends and no law a child growing up building its life entirely out of only the sense of its internal need and perhaps the very dim and distant paternal help of a great believing parent who led that child only in gentle ways if such a child so brought up so uh, given opportunity and its life not deranged or disarranged in any way by the prejudices and intemperances of a highly complicated society this child might grow up to be an honest person it's quite conceivable that this child would have that kind of a beginning that psychologists like to talk about at that wonderful normal background well perhaps as Pike points out the reason why the light of life has come from the ages is because in some mysterious way these progenitors these first uninvolved peoples these peoples that have not yet learned to hate these people who lived close to reality that in some way they are the basis of the strength that we possess they were the ones who grew up in a reality a factuality that we no longer have and because of this childlike honesty with which they faced life they have left the imperishable monuments to us because they were the only ones who were able to leave tradition before they were spoiled themselves later they were spoiled but in the root of things they were not and therefore in their infancy in their childishness God walked with them and because they were all wonder and all believing because they used only the simple faculties of primordial creatures they saw true they dreamed true and they came so close to reality that they have left us simple guides and rules and what we call progress is our own eternal effort to be as simple as they were to rediscover the directness of something which we have lost perhaps this is the reason why the light of the Veda shone upon the world why it is beneath everything why it has come down to us in a hundred religions simply because it represents the simple light of the beholder in which light and the eye and the heart responded together and that there was no deceit no confusion no prejudice by which the mind and the emotions could be led into error perhaps for another example we might pause for a moment and contemplate the effort of Gautama Buddha to restore this situation Pike has many things to say about this we're not here today or this evening to compare Buddhism and ancient Aryan Hinduism but we are only trying to make a point namely the point that we uh, brought, brought out last week the this mysterious power of essential cognition that the only way to see truth is to see without uh, preconception the only way to intuit truly is this mysterious uh, quietude which we must cultivate by means of which we can truly be still and know so Buddha says 
that if all of the volition of the will, all of the pressure of the machine of the sensory perceptions is brought into an absolute suspension, man then is no longer a seer. He is himself the total of the thing seeing and the thing seen without division. In this situation he cannot be deceived because no man can be deceived who does not first deceive himself. Thus these primitive people, not being smart enough to deceive themselves, themselves, have left us a heritage relatively free of deceit. There may be many other explanations, but because of the situation we have, perhaps that is far enough in the general's thinking to show that particular phase of his mind and how he attempted to, uh, to work with these problems. Uh, in his study, therefore, Pike first uh, establishes what he might term or considers to be one of the most primitive and valid forms of human worship, and that is what he calls the worship of nature. He tells us that these ancient peoples because of their peculiar insight, did not see nature as we do. We see nature as body. Ancient man saw nature as soul or life. We see nature as procreation. He saw it as psychic generation. We see nature as, a, as an arena or area of confused actions. He saw nature as a field of eternal motion. To him, therefore, the worship of nature did not mean that he bowed down to any ordinary weed or spear of grass that came along. Rather, man sought for and found the psychic life of nature. He saw nature as soul moving through body. He saw nature as a kind of wonderful living entity. And early in his thinking, he came to the inevitable conclusion that nature was just as much alive as he was. That he was not a living thing in a dead world. He was not merely an animate being in a mechanistic a machine of some kind. It never occurred to ancient man that the bear or the lion or the bird had any different basic attitudes upon life from his own. Therefore, in many instances, we find among these people the tendency to create legends and lore in which they humanize animals, even as uh, Aesop did much later and still later Fontaine. And therefore, we assume, for instance, we know the North American Indian of our Northwest, up around the Vancouver area. Uh, when he went uh, hunting in the woods, he he talked to uh, the, talked to the bear. When the Indian of the plain killed a buffalo, he made a ceremony, smoked the pipe of peace to the soul of the buffalo, sat down and talked with it, just as you would with another person explaining that he was not out hunting because he wanted to kill something, but because he had to live. And therefore, that he really sincerely hoped that his need would be understood. And sometime, if by transmigration he should become a buffalo, he would be perfectly willing to let a hunter kill him for the same reason. They had a really heart-to-heart -heart talk about this thing because it did not occur to this man that the world was different from himself. He did not believe that trees could not understand. He did not believe that rocks were dumb. Like Pythagoras, he spoke to the river and the stream answered him. Ancient man lived, therefore, in a world of life, not in a world of death. He lived in a world in which he beheld around him all kinds of differentiated life. He beheld also within himself faculties and powers in which many attributes seem to be united and brought together in his own more complex personality. At first, however, of course, this was not particularly meaningful to him. But the main point we wish to bring to attention is this concept 
of nature worship. That man found the objects of his adoration in the processes around him. He found many reasons to gradually transform his wonder into veneration. He began to venerate those things which seemed to him good. He began to fear those things which seemed to have uh, seemed to have some evil implication to himself. And out of this process of nature, uh, from his own perspective, he came to the inevitable conclusion that some things were better for him than other things. That some things seemed to serve him, others to offend him. And out of this, in turn, came a rudimentary concept of good and bad. And this projected against the great starlit sky of night, it also resulted in the gradual recognition of the suras and asuras, the gods and demons, the great good spirits and the evil spirits. And just as in his own world, there was the conflict of good and evil, so war began in heaven. And all the different problems that he faced, he saw parallels for in the world around him. Gradually, his unfolding faculties investigating things, to point out one of the ancient adages, that the more he saw, uh, the more completely he became frightened. While he accepted without question, he was at peace. The moment he questioned, he found proof for questioning. Whatever he looked for, he found. And in this seeking and finding, good and bad, simple doctrines and simple ideas gradually became more and more involved until out of them the ages have produced most complicated theological systems. Primitive man, Pike tells us, without reservation, as we have said, regarded the world is alive. Plato refers to it as the holy animal crawling through the sky. Ancient people, some felt that the world was a great turtle. Others that it was an elephant standing on a turtle's back. But whatever they thought it was, it was alive. It was the body of a great being. This great being was in a way the composite symbol extended from themselves and this great being which was the world became gradually also the visible symbol of the invisible power of God and as man is a soul in a body so God is a soul in a world and that this world soul therefore like the human soul sustained and supported this body man beheld himself growing and failing he saw youth and age, and he therefore contemplated the great procession of the ages. He contemplated the birth and death of worlds. He applied all these ideas of his own experience to the universe, and out of his own experiencing, he fashioned by degrees the ideas that were to be great and wonderful to him. And in the course of his time, and in the way he lived, the universe divided into really three parts. One part was heaven, the great vault of Indra, the sky, the great being whose body was filled with countless eyes. This tremendous and wonderful God, the God of the firmament, and the God that was the ancient God, like the Shanti of China, the old one, and in the course of a time, just as this uh, God slowly disappeared under the conditioning attributes of man's own investigation, so little by little the great old God, though not forgotten, uh, though not denied, passed generally out of our common apprehension. It was no longer enough that simply the great sky god was there. This deity began to express itself through its progeny, uh, through specialized and specific attributes, qualities and appearances rising out of itself. 
And just as in most religions a messiah has gradually taken the place of the original deity, so somewhere along the path of this great migration of peoples, the great old God sort of uh, retired, regained new interpretations, was given new appearances, was fitted into other faiths, many of his attributes remaining, but the one attribute which he originally possessed was gone and that was totality. Instead of totality, man recognizing that unity is never divided, but that division takes place within it, in the process of division, man loses sight of the unity. Therefore, it was, according to Pike, at a very ancient time, it is said that the great God uh, became more or less a martyr, was disfigured, took upon himself sackcloth and ashes, concealed himself in the body of the world and was then known only from his appearances in the world. And as Uranus, the great god of the Greeks, was defamed, injured, afflicted, mutilated uh, by those who sought to steal his empire, so the great father deity of the Arias uh, was gradually obscured until he appears again only as the eternal penitent, the eternal mendicant, uh, the one who must bear the burden, the sin, and the misery of all things. Then in his own place come forth the things out of himself, and they take dominion over him. For once in the great Nordic land there was a one-eyed giant by the name of Emer. This great giant ruled alone and forever in Gunungagap, the great gap in space. And then there came forth from the body of this great giant its own offspring or progeny. And they turned upon it and slew it, and from it they made the world. Now this, in a sense, is something uh, that uh, Pike feels sure that this particular story originated in Asia. He feels so because to him it is the perfect explanation of the peculiar situation in which the Hindu deity Brahma has become involved in the course of time. Namely, that while still recognized with certain definite veneration, it is also true that this deity is valued, is important, is conceived as great, somewhat uh, in a different or mysterious way. For it is his own son that brings him back into life and life again. He is the, he is the victim or he is the... Uh, sufferer who is redeemed by his own son Vishnu and it is only through the will and love of Vishnu that Brahma is again born and is born of course upon the lotus blossom uh, while Vishnu sleeps upon the serpent of eternity and uh, Pike has something to say about this which I think uh, is uh, important and it's interesting to us, because of the time, as I say, in which it was done, in comparison uh, to the tremendous amount of literature that we have today. Part of this, incidentally, will be interesting because it represents uh, Pike's original translation of sections of the Bhagavad Gita. He tells us, As Rama, the epic hero, armed with sword, club, and arrows, the prototype of Hercules and Mithras, he wrestles like the Hebrew patriarch with the powers of darkness. As Krishna Govinda, the divine shepherd, he is the messenger of peace, overmastering the world by music and love. Under the human form, he never ceases to be the supreme being. The foolish, he says in the Gita, unacquainted with my supreme nature, despise me in this human form. While men of great minds, enlightened by the divine principle within them, acknowledge me as incorruptible and before all things, and serve me with undivided heart. I am not recognized by all, he says again, because concealed by the supernatural power which is in me. Yet to me are known all things past, present, and to come. I existed before Manu. I am the Most High God, the Creator of the world. And although in my own nature I am exempt from liability to birth and death, and am Lord of all created things, 
Yet as often as in the world virtue is enfeebled, and vice and injustice prevail, so often do I become manifest, and am revealed from age to age, to save the just, to destroy the guilty, and to reassure the faltering steps of virtue. He who acknowledgeth me as even so, doth not in quitting this mortal frame enter into another, for he entereth into me. And many who have trusted in me, and have already entered into me, being purified by the power of wisdom, I help those who walk in my path, even as they serve me. Uh, this he then explains in the sense that the great deity, the great simple collective unit power, the inevitable, the unmovable, the un unchangeable, the essence of all things, that which is both being and becoming, this being was originally held under the symbolism of sky. It was held also under the alternating symbolism of day and night sky. And it was held in a mysterious way that night revealed the splendor of the sky even more than did the day. Therefore, the sky in day was obvious or evident, the sky, the sky, sky in night was a host of gods made visible by the setting of the sun. And uh, in this came another thought, that the sun, representing ego, representing selfness, representing in a way the light of reason, while it shines, the great God is not seen in all his splendor. The heavens uh, become merely background to the light of the sun. But when the sun fades, the heavens come forth again, and the grandeur of the eternal once more uh, shines down from all the points of light in the sky. Psychologically, then, the uh, essential idea is uh, that this totality gradually passed from the consciousness of man to be buried in the particulars of his own interests and observations. The great God was no longer the sky dweller. He was no longer the being remaining forever, sustaining and moving all things. He became rather the neighbor, the close one. He came to be the present help in time of trouble. His powers were invoked by men, and this deity was believed to be able to answer all of these prayers, <coughs> and from his great celestial universality could descend even to nourishing the particular and peculiar desires of mortals. Thus something happened, and this thing that, was happen that happened was that the supremeness of consciousness represented by this deity gave place to the, limit the limitation of ego, the rise of selfness, both in heaven and in man. And the selfness in man resulted in the emergence of the self-hero in heaven. The uh, rise of individuality, individualized deity, as far as human experience was concerned. This again became a very important factor in the gradual rise of systems. Now another point that Pike makes a great deal of is the emergence at a comparatively early time of groups, classes, or peoples, uh, not only in the term of a great migration, but in the term of the common life of man, the source of light. And this nearness is usually accompanied by a strange failing of outward parts, a strange detachment from the world. In other words, the prophet, the great teacher, as Buddha later said, has gone forth into homelessness. He has gone forth into a strange universal citizenship. He moves again toward the sky and with the sky. He was naturally inclined to seek the wilderness, to go forth to pray and to meditate. And the emergencies that always led him into these courses were the same emergencies. The need in himself and his instinctive sorrow for the need in others. 
these things always have divided some people from the rest. And somewhere in this great early time of things, the beginning of great institutions began to take place. Pike says that the mysteries of the Greeks, Egyptians, and Romans were all derived from the mysteries of Persia and India. Uh, that these institutions were the long shadow of man's basic way of learning and that they in turn gave birth out of themselves by division once more into two parts preserving in the one hand the great secret organizations of the world and on the other hand blossoming forth to become the great secular educational bodies of the world these two divisions happened uh, the, that part of learning which turned back to the contemplation of cause became religion that part of learning which turned to the contemplation of self became philosophy and that part of learning which turned to the contemplation of nature became science and these things were all just the way in which some primitive man seemed to turn his head. If he turned it one way, it was one thing. If he turned it the opposite way, it was the other. Not literally and physically his head, but his point of view, his perspective, his use of the faculties with which he had been endowed. If then we may say that there is much to indicate uh, certain points, what do we then find as the first uh, prerequisite of the patriarch, the prophet, the great teacher? Not just the, the aged one of today, but the great patriarchal figure that stands like Manu against the dark and mysterious uh, curtain of history. The first thing that we always do, the first thing that we inevitably uh, subconsciously uh, visualized is that we associate the patriarch, the prophet, the great emissary of wisdom with age. We instinctively in our psychological experiences uh, always think of the teacher self and visualize this teacher self in dream or vision as an ancient and venerable person. Now the reason why this began in the beginning was probably much simpler than we think. It was not due to the fact uh, that man had a particular uh, artistry in this respect or hit luckily upon the patriarchal figure as a symbol of authority. What actually happened was that as soon as man uh, recovered from the first impact of survival he began to recognize that he, that he had to preserve the vital value of age. So the first teachers of primitive man were the elders. The rest were out hunting and uh, working. The rest were out protecting the tribe. But when the hunter grew too old to hunt, uh, when the mother was no longer able to bear children uh, when the physical activities of the struggling people could no longer be borne by the decrepitude of years age began to reveal from itself one other value a great value age remembered age went back Age began to speak with the wisdom of years, of experience. Age had already been through these problems many times. So even today among primitive people, when a great problem affects the tribe, the elders are called. And this is important because if they hadn't had this use, the elders would probably have been exterminated, as they are in many primitive peoples who have different types of philosophy. But uh, suddenly it was realized that the elder was worth his keep. He was worth his keep and worth his food and worth also the admiration of his people because he spoke with the long memory.
as it was called. He knew heroes then dead and could describe them to the living. He could remember the great king whom the children had never seen but whose wonderful deeds they wanted to hear about. He could remember uh, the seasons and the great storms of long ago and he could remember the places where he had gone to hunt and where certain symptoms indicated that game would be plentiful. He could tell them from long years what the clouds meant and when the rain would come. He also had all the lore of his people and as time went on he became the great gossip and was only one step between uh, gossiping and deification. It all depends on what you gossip about. When you remember the private secrets of your neighbors, it is gossip. When you remember the great secrets of life, it is wisdom. And the, uh, the olds and the truths and the ones of the long remembering became gradually the symbol of man's wealth of heritage. And so against the background of our culture will be seen the shadowy forms of the great rishis, the great sages. They were, maybe they were models, and maybe in their own day they did not look nearly so venerable. But today they are venerable. Today they represent to us the voices of the past, as Pike calls them, the voices of the great shepherds, the voices of those who remembered the stars, the strange voices that speak with echoing tone down the corridors of time, the voices of the old ones, and their voices are rich with words of wisdom. So in the rise of things, the rishis, the saint and the sage, came to be regarded as the, com the companion of the gods. Not only did they seem to resemble him, but he seemed to resemble them. And when they spoke, it seemed that the gods were speaking, for the greatness of years was speaking. In these days also, again, the rather simple and direct life made possible this kind of memory. And by degrees the young ones came and sat around the feet of the aged one. And from him they received the orenda of the Iroquois. Received not only the story, but the strange vitality of dedication. They were part of something. In their veins flowed the blood of the heroic past. They were the heirs to the things the elders told them. And when one by one the elders slipped away, they in turn became elders to carry on the sacred heritage. So in the circle of the old ones was the history of the people, the mystery of its faith, the story of its dreams, the account of its migrations, and perhaps most of all, the wonderful reports of the heroes, the descriptions of things, so that the old one would say, this my father told me, and the children would sit around and listen. And in the strange process of listening, they became citizens. They became directed in their own lives. They began to see what it meant to be remembered. And each of the young ones said to himself, I shall so live that those who come after me shall remember me among the heroes. Little by little the virtues of the tribe were inculcated in this way. And as this body of lore became greater and greater, came with it also the skills, the crafts, and the knowledges of the people. Here also were not only the historical records, but the laws and legislation moved out of the great mystery of the circle of the elders, the ancient ones of the earth, as they have been called. And from them, as from the lips of Manu, have come the laws. 
So in the, Pike says, somewhere in the mysterious hinterland of man's thinking, there sits at the very beginning of this great Iranian Aryan migration, this strange, mysterious circle of the ancient ones of the earth. The ones to whom it seems all knowledge must be traced. All ideas seem to originate from them. All records, all reports of old times flow through them. They are the link between man and his own origin. All the wonderful things that he wants to know and he wants to believe. Now is it really uh, actually a fantasy at all or is this a sober truth? I'm inclined to think from experiences with so-called primitive peoples uh, that this is actually the sober truth. This actually happened. Because I know that today I could go into a primitive society and I would find that this is the way they live. That I can find immediate evidence that at the back of their belief and at their tradition is this circle of the elders perpetuated now by another circle of living elders who are the visible progenitors of the ancient ones, their servants, their priests, sharing in their veneration and venerated because they have in turn venerated. And if you want to go into a comparatively primitive society and you want to know the ways of that society and you want to understand its reason for existence, you sit with the elders and they will tell you. And they will tell you not in just prosaic language, do this and do that. They will do as ancient man did. They will sit back, they will be quiet, they will take their time according to their own pleasure. And when they have decided, they will speak with a strange tongue. Or they will say also, I will tell you a story. And whether this story is the Vedas or the book of Genesis, it is still the story. The story that has come down from the olds. And as time went along and these things became more integrated and knowledge became more pressing upon man and his own experience required more and more levels of answers in order that he might maintain certain perspective. Uh, these circles took on a strange value. And one of the values that happened was that everyone, every time, was not permitted to come and talk with the elders. You couldn't simply knock on the door any time you want to and have the ancient ones assemble on requirement. So to speak to the elders, to know them, to be taken into their story, to sit at their feet as the disciple at the feet of his guru, this was an occasion. This was something that might not happen often. Something rare. Something you had to live for and build for. And out of this came the gradual development of the puberty rites. And also the caste rites. And the, and the rites of growth and maturity. And the various tribal initiatory rites. Uh, that are described so well uh, by uh, some of our uh, great writers on primitive people, such as Churchwood in his uh, Signs and Symbols of Primordial Man. Uh, these rites were a sacred drama, a sacred institution, and uh, acceptance into them was the beginning of the life of maturity in the tribe. Until you had received these rites, you were not responsible. Until you know, it was not expected of you that you would do. But the moment you knew, you must do. Because to fail after we once possess knowledge is a grievous fault. But to fail without knowledge may only be a symbol of childishness. So when the time came for the child to become accepted into his people, he was purified, he was prepared, he was consecrated, he was tested and tried. And then, at the proper moment, 
and with proper ceremony he was brought to be instructed by the great teachers. These were the great teachers, he had met them all perhaps and played beside them in the village street. But when they gathered for this purpose they were something else again. They were suddenly very grave and venerable people sensing their own responsibility. The responsibility of carrying on to him the tradition that must not die. So with proper ceremonies he was tested, tried, and informed. And having been informed in Egypt the child lock of hair was cut off and his milk name was taken away from him and his man name was given to him. And he was then expected to go out and carry his part of the burden of life and to carry the responsibility of his people and to be above reproach in character because now he had seen. Now he knew the reason for his own existence and he knew the great and wonderful story of his people. Therefore in pride he should walk with his head high, proud that he was part of so great and glorious a social structure. He must defend it with his life and honor and his worldly goods and never betray it. Thus out of this background came the gradual rise of the great mystery institutions of India, Persia, Egypt, Greece, and the Americas. Here also came gradually from these mystery institutions as budding from an ancient stem secular education as we know it. Gradually the importance of arts and crafts and sciences were emphasized in man's economic survival and education became the transmission of man's acquired skills rather than the perpetuation of man's internal insight. So for lack of insight his skills lead him into trouble. But uh, the, the ancient system placed his moral character first and his vital attainments high in this pattern. Pythagoras of Samos in the 6th century traveled through most parts of the known world of his own day. He visited many of the great sanctuaries of the mysteries. He learned that the Egyptian of the cult of Osiris believed that their deity in the form of a sacred bull had been driven from India and had been brought from Asia into the temple. He learned of the indebtedness of these peoples to each other and he also realized that if this great stream of the great Iranian Aryan tradition uh, did flow around the world, it flowed because of the existence of this great interrelated system of esoteric educational orders. Pythagoras discovered and after reaching, visiting and affiliating with more than 20 great religious groups that in his day this stream of tradition moving from the east was moving with an adequate mechanism that this mechanism was a system of education that then prevailed that this system of education like tubes or pipes channeled the great water of life and that as late as the second or third century AD that actually the great religious centers of both East and West were in communication with each other and that all these systems and all these channels recognized their common dependency upon one great stream of spiritual light. If this be so and there seems much evidence to sustain it then we can understand how this ancient river falling from the head of the gods did descend not only into the great Indo-Gangetic plain but through the mysteries flowed into Egypt, Greece, Samothrace, Sparta, uh, Elysus uh, to form the great rites of the Kabiri and many other of the Dionysian cults. Orpheus came from the east to Greece bringing the same tradition and the reason therefore perhaps that we find traces of one religion under the numerous and almost countless separations of sects today is that religion in its turn 
as we know it today, for the uh, what we call religion today really had no counterpart in the ancient world. But what we call religion today is really the opening of the doors of the ancient mystery temples and the flowing out of their teaching into a more democratic uh, type of society. What we study in school today was once part of the mystery religion. It was the mystery religion that gave the world mathematics, that gave it art and literature, philosophy, medicine, and law. These things were all parts of the temple religions. But gradually they have flowed out into our more common way of life. But if they came from the mystery temples, and the mystery temples themselves came from a common tradition, and this tradition flowed from the northern parts of Asia, then we can easily see why some simple emblem or symbol, some statute, some name, some term we daily use now could well be traced back to this original source. It was in the light of this, of course, that Lopunyum, exploring the mysteries of the Mayas and Kichi of Central America and studying their hieroglyphics, made to him the important discovery that because he had already been a student of Egyptian hieroglyphics, he could decipher most of those of the Western Hemisphere. He may not have been entirely correct, but he did establish, beyond any doubt, hundreds of parallels, not only in the symbolic and glyph forms, but actually in the pronunciation of words. So that the word for man, or the word for sun, or the word for life, or the word for God, in the languages of the old world and the new were identical. Thus these streams had to have flowed from somewhere. We may want to take the idea of spontaneous generation of these ideas in isolated areas, and if we had to, we could contemplate the possibility that all men reaching a certain degree of culture would come to certain common conclusions about things. This would be suitable if we could not establish the bridges by means of which we know that in a still simpler way, the migrations of peoples and the unfoldment of learning in all of its branches would carry this knowledge, this great stream, without strange, mysterious, or psychological circumstances. It is as common as the bow and arrow migration or the swastika migration or any of the other primitive, symbolic, migratory uh, patterns by which we have learned to measure the travelings and uh, adventures of peoples. We know that these things could have happened. We know that almost certainly they did happen. And we know also that practically every scriptural book of the world today is indebted to those of Asia, simply because in this Asiatic pattern we seem to come upon the oldest and most clearly defined example of something. And that the motion of these peoples through time gradually resulted in their domination, and with their domination in many regions, their ancient beliefs came to permeate and dominate these regions, slowly causing older beliefs or other unrelated doctrines to be submerged. Now when we study this a little further, we make another interesting discovery, namely that this great cycle had about it something that was very Neoplatonic. The gods of the ancient Arya, these strange sky, earth, and altar deities that we have come to remember, did not in those times or under those conditions declare war upon the gods of other men. That was very much later when things got into pretty bad shape. Actually, uh, these great deities like Osiris in his celebrated journey around the world uh, converted people with a strange tenderness. The conversion was a rather simple thing. This great interpretation accepted into itself all other interpretations and the light of the Veda shining upon other beliefs caused these other beliefs to shine with its own light. It was simply a light cast upon all things, causing these things to resemble itself. Thus in Egypt, for example, the old gods of Egypt, uh, prior to contact with Asia, did not cease. 
they simply took on an Asiatic look. The ancient gods of the Nords, uh, for instance, Tor, the thunderer, the individual who seemed to spend most of his time fishing for the Midgard snake or throwing his hammer in the form of a swastika around the world, it was perhaps the oldest form of the boomerang, this deity was once the supreme deity of the Nordic pantheon. But later, when Odin, or the Teutonic Votan, nor probably, really, Prince Sigi, a Scythian prince, came from Asia and came into domination in this area, he did not go to war with Tor. He did not destroy him. He did not say he was a false god. And when the great uh, cult of Odin was set up at Uppsala in Scandinavia, uh, Tor was invited to dinner with the rest. Uh, Tor became a member of the new family. Tor became merely an attribute. He became an embodiment of one of the characteristics of this new doctrine. So in many instances in the old legends we hear that saints going forth like Patmos Abada in Tibet first of all converted all the demons, converted all the false gods and made them all members of the true faith. It was a wonderful thing. It was done very nicely because these deities simply became uh, repolarized so that they became the aspects and attributes of the new principle which was taking over. Thus in practically all of these faiths among the ancient peoples, particularly back at about that time which we call the dark curtain of history, we see a marked change in the pattern of the divinities. The old hero gods, the gods of lesser station, the old fighters and rumblers and tumblers of the early days, uh, sort of fade away or become associated with a newer and better spiritual perspective. They then become the obedient instruments of the new faith. They were remembered and continued to have certain honors paid to them. But they had been changed until they were compatible with the new doctrine. And wherever it went, this great stream of vitality absorbed and reinterpreted other faiths or found itself in other faiths until finally all of the conflict or inconsistency was dissolved. As a result of that, uh, other elements are present in all religions. But the great basic elements of this tremendous tradition survived and dominated and continued. Uh, Pike, uh, explaining his, his concept, makes a great use of what he considers to be one of the oldest and richest forms of nature worship. And he devotes in his writings many, many pages, including learned translations from Hebrew, Persian, even Coptic Greek, and a careful study of the available manuscripts and records of the Egyptians and of the East Indian people and the Chinese to prove very definitely the supreme importance in the psychic descent of man's great stream of faith, the supreme importance of the symbolism of the worship of fire. <clears throat> now Pike is one of the first, of course, to remind his reader that uh, the worship of fire is entirely a symbolic ceremony. Uh, fire was no more worshipped by fire worshippers than the sun was by sun worshippers. Always fire became associated in an early time with life. Fire was the first discovery that completely altered and changed the destiny of man. Agni, the spirit of fire, like Prometheus, was one of the first great friends of man. Fire to primitive man uh, had a series of mystical connotations. Uh, by means of fire it seemed that man could create life. He became a magician. 
He could invoke radiance out of darkness. Fire had many, many meanings to him, but perhaps its greatest and most important meaning was life. A fire was a life in his keeping, a life that he could tend. Fire was upon an altar, and he could bring his offering to it, and he could protect the fire. And the fire became the symbol of his own stewardship to eternal life. Man began to associate the extensions of the symbolism of fire with innumerable moods and attitudes of his own. Even today, we have the term very closely associated uh, with a great many of our psychological, most subtle implications of thinking. We say that an individual is inflamed with an idea. We say that he is fired by a purpose. We, re we refer to the rise of, of intellectualism in man as the blazing forth of a spark. We know also that fire was associated with heat, heat and warmth with body, and that death for man was the going away of the fire, going away of the heat, going away of the warmth. A Muslim um, scientist many centuries ago, attempting to determine the nature of the life in things, performed uh, dissections up, or vivisections upon living animals and at one time he placed his finger on, the, on a certain point in the pulsing heart of a living animal and immediately his finger was blistered. He found there a point of great heat and he became quite concerned with it and wrote considerably on the subject. But Life is heat to ancient man, and the fire in man burned upon the matchless altar of his heart. The heart was the sanctuary of the flame. The flame was life. When the flame burned, man lived. When the fuel perished, man died. Uh, Buddha, in one of his discourses, goes into considerable detail in a symbolical use of fire. He explains, for example, that if every fire on earth was extinguished so that man never could see fire anywhere, and that all the storms and all the changes of nature were such that lightning would never strike, that no natural friction or reflection would ever cause a fire, so the world was without fire for 10,000 years. And then, if there be a person to do it, flint is struck against steel and fire is born again. Fire is everywhere, silently, secretly, unknown, but it must be brought into manifestation, and the manifestation of fire out of the totality of itself into the expression of itself was a mystery that ancient man greatly contemplated. He also greatly revered the purifying power of fire, how fire cleansed things, and also how fire consumed the sacrifice. He also saw how fire consumed the fuel that sustained it, and that when the fuel was gone, fire uh, disappeared. And in modern times, man has discovered a strange kind of fire that burns without dross, as we know it. And that fire is a form, of course, of electricity. And we put that fire in a little glass bottle, and we made an electric light. And when we first made that light, what did we call it? We called it the Mazda light. We, have, uh, we had already gone back uh, to an ancient term for light, uh, for brilliance, uh, for shiningness. In the ancient uh, Hindic people, the old gods, the devas or devs, meant the shiners or the light ones. And everything that was light, everything that shone, was life. And where the fly, flame went out, where the fire failed, things died. Then there were the fires of holy aspiration, the fire of martyrdom. Then there was a fire of zeal and of hope, 
and the strange blazing passion of love. There was fire of hate and everywhere there was fire there was heat there was light. The primitive man gradually devised the concept of Agni as the symbol of the power of life. Fire became the visible symbol of the quality of life. Life living on matter. Life perpetuating itself by destroying its own not-self. Spirit flaming forth because of the fuel. The fuel which it is to consume. Consciousness consuming body and perhaps if the pessimism of Buddha is correct, dying with it. But uh, a great blaze while still it shines. The candles upon an altar, the incense burner, the oil lamp, all these symbols like the ever burning lamp of the rosy cross or the strange eternal lamp found in the tomb of Cicero's daughter. The lamps that burn on, the lamps with wick of asbestos, strange conjectures and chemistries and alchemies of ancient thinking. But always this problem of fire. This problem of man worshipping the flickering variable symbol that is so alive that its body is part of its life and cannot be seen from it. The fire that can be put out by the mystery of water and then the alchemist coming along with his strange formula which says I shall make a fire that burns in water and I shall make a fire which the fuel is water and this fire shall burn forever. Now the ever burning fire is to a measure probably at least in one of its degrees associated with the sun. The sun this great incandescent light this symbol of radiance that became warm in summer and in the desert a destroying heat. But the fire and the sun and light, these together man identified ultimately with his own truest self, his own consciousness. So that fire and light became symbols of consciousness. For man was aware by a kind of invisible light within himself, the light of reason, the light of the mind, but most of all the light of the soul. In the old uh, uh, early Rosicrucian symbolism there is an ancient representation of Christian Rosenkreuz, the secret master of the Rosy Cross, reading a book by the light of a candle. Uh, there is some probability that the picture was originally taken from the familiar portrait of Saint Jerome by Albrecht Dürer. But in any event, the point is that by the light of a candle or a lamp or a fire, man reads a book. He reads also the mysterious living book by the light of consciousness within himself. So without the fire, the mind is meaningless. Without fire, love fails. Without fire, rationality is impossible. And this fire must be the fire of awareness, the fire of consciousness within the individual. For man reads not by the light of the sun on the outside alone. By that he sees the letters. But by the light of the sun in himself he sees the meaning. And that is the great and important difference. So the sun became also the symbol of meaningfulness. It became the symbol of true cognition. And fire was the sacred part in man. And as time went on the fire was associated with the soul. And the soul was this beautiful radiant flaming part with an aureole like existence. And this soul was the light in man. And the fire and the light also came to be representative of enlightenment and of the enlightened. And under this same thought we have in our own scriptures uh, the mystery of the light of the world the being that came to give light to every man or to every creature that lived. For the very word Christ from Christos simply means the fuel of the flame. It represents the mysterious oil of baptism. But this is the oil which supports the flame. 
and the Eucharistic ceremony, and Melchizedek with a corn, wine, and oil, establishing the sacred sacrament. The oil is the symbol of the fuel of God, which if lit turns all of man into a strange uh, burning thing, burning with the power of the divine presence. So in the tabernacle we have the seven-branched candlestick. We have the great being of Revelation walking amidst the candlesticks with a blazing sword coming from his mouth. All these symbols go back to the old belief in fire. And fire, the holy aspiration which burns all decay. Fire, the divine desire of man to be one again with truth. Fire, the symbol of his everlasting and eternal covenant with life, causes each individual to be a keeper of the flame. And this ancient man strangely comprehended, because it was fire that gave him dominion over the world. And it could only mean that this fire was the symbol of the soul, for it was only the soul in him which enabled him to take dominion. It was only because this fire lighted his life and that another fire from within himself blazed forth that man could be other than a brute and could achieve or attain other things than the beast could attain. So as we say, fire became the symbol of soul. It became the, se the symbol of a covenant. It became the living witness of the eternal before men. For it was the purest of all bodies and into this flame all dross, all imperfection, all human limitation, all selfishness must be cast as an offering to the Most High. So fire worship came also strangely from this great strange northern region. And in the form of the god Agni, it came to have a very great and important part in the rituals of our ancient forebears. And we might mention one other for the moment we mentioned last week but I think we must come back to it again and that was Varuna and Varuna was also an ancient deity of these peoples and Varuna was a strange airy power uh, Varuna was a strange all-pervading atmosphere that linked all things into a strange capacity uh, Varuna was a lord of middle regions and of parks. Uh, Varuna, in many ways, perhaps, if you study the uh, symbolism of the deity, is reminiscent of the psychological idea of mind. Mu uh, Varuna is an intellectual atmosphere, a wind uh, deity, a god of motion and of moving things, a god invisible but made visible by consequences. A deity that also went through innumerable vicissitudes, as uh, General Pike points out. But we have here then sky, fire, and air. Or as we also suggested in the other uh, in the other discussion that we had, there are certain parallels between Varuna and ether. Not the air as we know it, but the etheric humidity uh, which science has invented as a hypothetical medium between energy and matter. Thus, as Heraclitus tells us, this peculiar humidity can also be a water deity, or a deity of humidity, or a deity of fertility. And in the, uh, as we told you last time, out of the names of these deities and out of the patterns of them we gain the elements of the divine name in the ancient ritualistic uh, language but we have elements that work together in a very strange manner because we have now actually established a trinity that corresponds to the three elements salt sulfur and mercury in the hermetic experiment and in the 18th degree of the Rose Croix, General Pike gives us some information on the tie between alchemy and the great Vedic mythology, showing again that at the root of chemistry, 
at the root of astronomy, at the root of architecture, are the parallels once more to this ancient system of thinking, and that these parallels can be restored from any study of essential symbolism in any department of human life. But we have the all, the all-pervading, symbolized by the great two-and-a-half-syllable monosyllable. We have then also fire, and we have air, or air-water, humidity, the ether of space, perhaps the energy or electric field of modern science. These things all working together give us a pattern of primordials, and we have uh, various uh, interpretations based upon the chemistry of these original factors. Mind, for example, as the bridge, the bifrost, between Midgard and Valhalla. Mind arises in the form of the great world hero. The great world hero passes the mystery of fire. In the case of the Sigurd Saga, the world hero passes through the mystery of the four elements, represented by four great labors which he performs. This uh, mastery by the hero of the interval, the middle distance between the worlds is very important. Fire as soul and consciousness. Uh, air water as mind emotion, the psychic part again. And heaven as totality, as the reality, as the wholeness. These together create a triangle or trinity which emerges later for our con contemplation in the Brahma Vishnu Siva concept of creation, preservation, and reconstruction. Always the symbolism remains, and wherever we have a holy trinity, from the temple of heaven in Peking to the three tiered hat of the Dalai Lama and the triple tiara of the uh, uh, Roman Pontiff. In all these we have mastery over three worlds, three elements, three conditions of being. We have man moving from the material through the psychical to the spiritual. We have the individual overcoming the world, nursing the flame, guarding it, becoming a servant of it. For one form of the flame is found in the grail legend. Uh, for the flickering, mysterious, flaming blood in the sun grail is exactly the same as the ancient fire of the Vedas. It is the object of the quest. It is the sacramental uh, symbol. It is the symbol of sacrifice and reunion, of renunciation and purification. In all these things then, and also through our own scripture writings and into our arts and sciences, into our legal procedure, into electricity, and even into electronics, we will find the same principles that these primitive persons, or this great wave of simple, direct, true-seeing creatures or beings, brought forth out of the dawn of time and carried with them into all parts of the world. The picture is long and difficult, but I think what General Pike particularly wants us to realize, that uh, the word Freemasonry and its original meaning from the Chaldean means child of the fire. The word pyramid represents the mountain or monument to the flame. That's what the word means. And in the ancient times of Elysus, when the high elephant in his robes of blue and gold came forth upon the porch of the sanctuary, his gold and blue robes, with the inner and outer circles of a flame, a flame with its blue center and its golden radiant core, the garments of priesthood. All of the ancient symbols that we know are derived from the guardians, keepers, and watchers of the ancient fires. And these fires were brought from heaven by the druids who captured the rays of the sun on a reflecting glass. And all the fires of earth are to these sacred monuments reflections of the fires that burn forever in the heavens. And these fires are the eyes of the gods. And each of these eyes and each of these fires in turn 
is part of the great flame of the one God that lies at the root of things. We are sparks from the flame, and to the flame we will return. This, I think, is probably all we can do this evening, so we will continue with the good general next week.